So, good afternoon, everyone. Today, the Adams Seminar has the great pleasure of welcoming Dr. Tim Kruger. Dr. Kruger received his diploma in physics at the Heidelberg University, and then he received his PhD from Bochum University in partnership with the Max Planck Institute. Nowadays, he's a reader in chemical engineering at the University of Edinburgh. Dr. Kruger's research and teaching interests are in the field of simulation of complex fluids through the lattice Boltzmann method, including particle sorting and separation, blood flow modeling, cell dynamics, and suspension rheology. Among his several contributions, he is a member of the German Physical Society and the Institute of Physics and Engineering in Medicine. He is also known for writing one of the core lattice Boltzmann books used in many universities throughout the world, including our own. So once again, welcome Professor Tim Kruger. Thank you so much for being here with us and please feel free to start your presentation. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, let me share my desktop. Okay, you should see that now for the screen. Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, perfect. Right. Um, so what, uh, sorry. Okay. What I would like to talk about today is, um, it's maybe slightly different from what you have seen in uh, previous ATOM seminars. I, it's not really a research seminar. It's also not a rigorous mathematical presentation. I just want to motivate a bit what the lattice Boltzmann method is, um, how you might use it, where it comes from, and um, uh, provide a bit of um, what's a top level um, ideas regarding modeling in general, because I think that is something we need to consider when we talk about fluid mechanics. Uh, don't be put off by the number of slides. I um, might actually skip quite a few of them, and I hope I will not talk for more than 40 minutes overall. Uh, you mentioned, Arthur, that um, I co-authored a book about the lattice Boltzmann method, which you see here. Um, a lot of content you see in the presentation is taken from that book to make my life easier. And uh, you can find that book online and uh, probably also in your library. And of course, um, if there are any questions, uh, please get in touch with me. Because I won't talk about my own research today, this is really more like a, uh, a lecture about um, Lattice Boltzmann. I have just a single slide where I want to give you an idea of what is happening in the research group. I've seen that a few members of my research group are also in the audience. Um, there are essentially two or three different topics we are working on. One of them is blood flow, where we look at um, cellular suspensions of red blood cells. Everything is computational. It's just computer simulations. Whenever you see a publication coming from the group with uh, experimental data, this is in collaboration with other people. Um, related to blood flow, um, microfluidics research, where we, for example, investigate how particle suspensions behave in microfluidic devices. Uh, typical applications are particle separation for diagnostics um, or particle manipulation that can be used for downstream processes. There is also a third research direction here that I call complex flows in lack of a better word for that. Um, complex flows, you can imagine that's everything that is not blood flow and microfluidics here. Uh, where you have navier stokes or fluid mechanics plus something on top. For example, um, you have uh, fluid fluid interfaces, uh, surface tension, um, things like this, where you have additional forces in, in the flow. What I would like to do today, short introduction, um, talking about fluid mechanics in general, then um, maybe 15, 20 minutes or so about the kinetic theory of gases, because it's important to know about that if you want to understand Lattice Boltzmann. Um, I might actually skip the discussion about boundary conditions. Uh, I might run out of time. It is not essential. And of course, there's also a summary at the end. So what I, what I would like to motivate, first of all, is that if you think about fluid dynamics or fluid mechanics, you can find it in all kinds of scales in the world around us. Maybe the smallest scale or one of the smallest scales where we would say we, we observe fluid mechanics is around one micrometer. Uh, you can think about microbes swimming around in, um, in an aqua solution, for example, like uh, in this picture. 
If you go to a slightly larger scale, you can think about droplets and microfluidic devices. Um, you can think about inkjet printing, which is typically happening on a scale below one millimeter. Then of course, um, effects like capillarity on the centimeter scale or maybe millimeter centimeter scale. Uh, and we can go on food stuff. Um, if you paint your wall, there's fluid mechanics involved. The scales are getting larger and larger. If you think about aircraft and um, turbulence in particular, for example, um, how many planes can you have on a runway per minute? You have to think about the vortices that are um, formed and um, uh, how long does it take for the next plane to be safe on the runway? Essentially, these are all fluid mechanical questions. And of course, we can go up. Um, as you know, in Europe, we currently have um, uh, an energy crisis and um, everyone is talking about renewables. Here you see a large scale wind park where people are interested in optimizing the overall performance. What happens if you not just have one turbine, but let's say you have 100 turbines and uh, they may affect each other. They will most certainly affect each other. And that is happening on the scale of kilometers. And then of course, the largest scale on the planet would be ocean circulation, but it doesn't really stop there because you can look at the sun. Uh, you can even look at, um, um, for example, interstellar gas and so on. So fluid mechanics spans at least 12 orders of magnitude in your personal experience, but there's a bit more space at the bottom and at the top. Now, what is interesting that um, we use essentially the same set of equations for all of these phenomena, the Navier-Stokes equations. In this case, um, you see the incompressible Navier-Stokes equation. And um, I want to make a transition to modeling of fluid mechanics very quickly. So the question is, um, of course, you can perform experiments and so on, but if, if we want to get a solution other than from an experiment, um, the simplest approach might be analytical approaches, but that doesn't always work or it rarely works because the Navier-Stokes equation, it's a partial differential equation. We have typically complex boundary conditions the Navier-Stokes equations are nonlinear in the velocity. It's extremely challenging to get analytical solutions for general problems. And this means we need to run computer simulations. We need to find computational solutions to the Navier-Stokes equation. Now, you are probably familiar with a number of methods in computational fluid dynamics. I think prime methods, prime examples are the finite difference method and the finite volume method. There are also other sophisticated approaches like spectral methods. Um, if you look at COMSOL, for example, COMSOL uses finite elements, which is not that common for fluid mechanics, but it's definitely possible. Uh, these are all methods you have seen before, and they are commonly used for solving fluid mechanical problems. Now, um, what are certain problems that might arise when you use conventional CFD. And by conventional, I mean the methods that are just listed. Uh, if you have complex geometries, mesh generation can be an issue, in particular if the geometries are moving. Typically, you have to remesh because your elements deform too much. You need to treat boundary conditions, which are really an integral part of fluid mechanics. And I will get back to that later on. Uh, and if you are interested in incompressible Navier-Stokes, then you have to solve a Poisson pressure equation, which is really difficult to do if you have a large grid and if you have a large volume. So there are a number of issues. And of course, there are solutions or partial solutions to these issues in um, conventional CFD. But the question is, um, can we use different approaches for fluid mechanics that may not have or not in that form these issues? So just to, to wrap up my introduction part, I think you, you all agree that fluid dynamics, uh, you find it everywhere in nature, in science and engineering. Um, if we want to get solutions to the Navier-Stokes equation, and um, well, we have to ask, are the Navier-Stokes equations actually the best equations for fluid mechanics? I will, I will get back to that. Um, if we want to solve the Navier-Stokes equation, then typically we need computational methods because it's very difficult to do this analytically. Um, but there are some issues with uh, CFD. Now, 
what if we tried a different approach? What if we look at fluid mechanics from a different point of view? Because we all know that in reality, fluids are not continuous, as the Navier-Stokes equation tells us. Uh, fluids are, of course, made up of molecules. And maybe there is something we can do about that. I'm not talking about molecular simulations. Of course, you could set up an MD, molecular dynamic simulation of pipe flow, but no one would do that because you, you simply don't have the computational resources and you would probably not learn anything new anyway. What I mean is, uh, let's get inspired by what is happening below the continuum and look at what we can do with these ideas to actually solve continuum problems. So let's uh, move to the kinetic theory of gases. Now, um, I think what is useful is, first of all, to understand that we have a range of different scales in fluids. If we start at the bottom left, um, the index A here in LA means atomic um, length. So LA is the atomic length scale. This is um, 10 to the minus 10 meters typically. Um, and the typical time scale at this scale is uh, the collision of molecules or atoms. So TC is the collision time. If you then look at a, a certain subvolume where you have quite a number of molecules, of fluid molecules, then typically you have some voids between these molecules, in particular in gases. And um, the molecules will be able to move some distance before they collide. And uh, during this um, trajectory where they don't collide, uh, we call this the, the mean free path, there, there's not much happening, but all the interesting physics happens when molecules actually collide because molecules will change direction. And uh, this typically happens within a time scale T mean free path, which is longer than the collision time itself. And um, on the large scale here, you could imagine that you have, let's say in engineering, you have a reactor that may be a cubic meter of volume. Um, and this would be, this, this defines the length scale of the system. So LS would be the system length scale. Um, and maybe you have a sub volume of interest where something relevant happens, let's say length scale L, which is a bit smaller than the system size. Uh, if you if you zoom in a bit, you of course at the top level everything is a continuum, but at some point you can say, well, I have a subvolume which is sufficiently small compared to my system size, but in the subvolume I have a let's say a manageable number of molecules, and um, I cannot simply ignore the presence of these molecules. I might not be interested in what every single molecule is doing but I would be interested in some statistics. And um, I think this is relevant for the atom seminar series to talk about statistical physics. So let's look at that in a bit more detail. Um, if we have um, a molecule or let's say argon as, as, a, as a nice example, you have argon atoms in um, under standard conditions, the room temperature, standard pressure and so on then first of all, you can work out that the average speed of an argon atom is about 400 meters per second, which is actually more than the speed of sound. This is the average speed of every single molecule around you in the air. You can also work out the number density. Uh, you get about 40 moles per cubic meter under standard conditions. And if you take the size of, of an atom, about um, 0.1 nanometers, you can then also work out what is the average distance between atoms, and this would be about three nanometers in a, in a gas, right? In a liquid, it's of course different. Um, you can look at the time scales. Collision time scale is typically 0.3 picoseconds, and the mean free path is about 30 times longer in um, argon at standard conditions, just to give you a feel for what is going on. Now, if we get back to the macroscopic picture and um, engineers who are interested in, let's say, practical problems, they very often are just interested in the continuum picture. What, uh, what is happening? Whenever you take the Navier-Stokes equation, you already assume that the fluid of interest is a continuum material. And this is possible to assume, or it's a good assumption, because the length scale of interest 
is typically much, much larger than the mean free path of the molecules. If your length scale of interest becomes similar to the mean free path, then of course the continuum assumption becomes a very, very poor assumption and we have to do something different. Now, um, in Navier-Stokes, we don't have any molecules. So there's nothing in the Navier-Stokes equation that tells you about the existing existence of molecules. You just have continuous fields, velocity, pressure, and density. And we call this process coarse graining, where we go from something small and resolved to something large and a bit more, you know, we, we reduce the number of degrees of freedom. We look at effective properties. This is a coarse graining approach. And what we get as an, as an output would uh, be the continu continuity equation that is um, telling us something about the mass conservation in mathematical form and the Navier-Stokes equation under some assumptions. Now, if we look at different scales and what kinds of um, physical viewpoints we have and also which kind of methods are available, on the micro scale, which I well, I don't want to define it, but order of magnitude nanometers, right? It can, it's also a bit larger than that. The underlying physics, it would be molecular. You would look at Newton's equations if you're not um, interested in uh, ab initio simulations, for example, where you really need to look at quantum effects and so on. So let's assume we have already classical physics. Then you would look at um, Newton's equations of motion in a molecular picture. And if you want to solve that numerically, you would run a molecular dynamic simulation. Now, on the macro scale, where um, we can safely assume the continuum, we would take the Navier-Stokes equation, for example. We assume there's a continuum, and we would use conventional CFD. And this is what has been done for decades. On the mesoscale, which is somewhere in between, the mesoscale is where you have groups of molecules, you're not interested in the single molecule, but you know that there is something happening on the molecular level that is somewhere in between, between micro and nanometer. Uh, you have a probabilistic view, for example. Um, one governing equation that you can use for that is the Boltzmann equation. There's also the Enskog equation, but um, let's look at the Boltzmann equation. And the DSMC, uh, Direct Simulation Monte Carlo, uh, for example, would be a numerical method um, to, to deal with that. Now, what I want to do before I move on to Lettuce Boltzmann, um, I want to remind everyone what we as scientists should do when we set up and run computer simulations. Um, so let's start with reality. Reality means if you look around you, you will see certain things happening. And you can say that is reality because this is what, what is happening around you there. You are not making any assumptions. You are not um, modeling anything yet. Uh, this is simply what, what we can call reality. Now, the first step, if you want to investigate reality, would be to conceptualize what you see and define a physical model that is hopefully simpler than reality. So for example, if you're interested in fluid mechanics or let's say ocean dynamics, then you will identify those physical mechanisms that are relevant for the system of interest and you would ignore everything else. Of course, you don't always know what is relevant and what you can ignore and that's part of the problem. You might have to go in circles a few times, but uh, roughly speaking, the first step is to identify what is actually important here and what can I ignore. The second step is uh, formalization, where you write down the physical model in mathematical form. It's, well, if you say I'm interested in incompressible um, fluid mechanics, then you could say, well, let's write down the incompressible Navier-Stokes equation, for example. Then, um, and this is all about computer simulations, at some point you have to discretize your equations because your computer will otherwise not really understand what's going on. And discretization is a very general word here. Uh, you, you have all kinds of different ways to, um, to develop a numerical model that you can then code up. So once you have the numerical model, it's still on paper, you code it up, you program your um, software, and then you can run the simulation. And then, of course, as you know, there are two ways to 
uh, two fundamental ways to check what's going on. You can first of all compare your simulation results with a mathematical model, uh, and that is um, called verification, just to make sure that you didn't make any mistakes with the numerical model or the implementation. And something that is also extremely important, of course, is validation, where you actually take your simulation and compare it with reality, for example, with an experiment. And uh, here, I don't know exactly how many um, young researchers we have here, but um, what I would really like to share is um, something problematic that happens quite often. If you start somewhere as a, as a PhD student or maybe postdoc, uh, what might happen is that your supervisor gives you a numerical model and he or she says, use this model and apply it to this particular problem. But there might not have been a check whether that numerical model is actually appropriate for that physical model. I see that quite often. And this happens because maybe at some point there was a physical model a numerical model was developed in order to investigate it. And then people think maybe we can apply it to something different, but then this loop from the physical model back to the numerical model is not renewed. And then of course you can simulate everything you want and it can be extremely wrong, even if you get nice simulation results. So this is just a word of, warn of warning. Whenever you want to look at a new physical problem, you should check that you do the right thing. And uh, that can mean that um, your algorithm is not appropriate anymore. Maybe you um, cannot assume that your liquid is incompressible, for example, or it is not Newtonian anymore. You need a non-Newtonian model, things like this. So having said that, um, we are now in a good position to think about Navier-Stokes and what to do about it. Um, and the key question here is, can we use maybe a mesoscopic approach to solve the Navier-Stokes equation? And that sounds maybe a bit outrageous because you would say, well, if I want to solve the Navier-Stokes equation, I will just develop a CFD method that is a direct discretization of the Navier-Stokes equation. And of course, this is what we should do. I mean, this is what people believed for, uh, for some time. However, from a physics point of view, um, you can say, well, I know that matter in a fluid is made up of atoms and molecules. And in the classical picture, they move around and they behave according to Newton's equations, and we can use MD. Then, for those of you who know already um, kinetic theory in more detail, we can come up with a Boltzmann transport equation to describe what is happening on the mesoscale, which is a coarse-grained version of what is happening on the microscale. And there has been, I mean, you can show that the Navier-Stokes equation, it's, I mean, for some time there were some mathematical issues with that. That's why you see a question mark here, but you can in principle show that the Boltzmann transport equation leads to the Navier-Stokes equation if you cross grain further, okay? And now the question is, um, if we discretize the Boltzmann equation, can we use the resulting algorithm to actually solve the Navier-Stokes equation, as you can see it here in the middle? So just to show you what my aim is for, for the seminar talk, is if we start with the Boltzmann equation and we do something to it, to discretize it, can that also be seen as a solver for the Navier-Stokes equation? Um, I do not want to, I, I do not talk about lattice gas um, and so on and um, MD in, in detail today. Um, now, how to get rid of unimportant microscopic details? Um, I told you that uh, ideally we have a hierarchy of length and time scales, and then we have a clean separation of um, scales and effects, and we can cross grain very easily. Um, what we do is, if we, if you imagine we have a volume, then we subdivide this volume into small volumes, where each volume is so small that um, we have many of them but we still have a significant number of molecules in each of these small volumes. And what we then do, we look at one of these volumes and we say, instead of tracing all the molecules in that volume, which could be thousands or millions with velocity vectors, position vectors, and so on, um, we can instead say, well, let's define a distribution function F that is defined for every box at point X, and of course, things might change over time. So there's a time dependency. And we ask how many molecules do we have that are currently moving with velocity psi? 
So for example, 400 meter, meters per second along the x-axis or maybe um, at a 45 degree angle between axis and so on. So uh, Xi is of course another continuous coordinate in, in space, uh, not in space, in velocity space where it tells us what velocity a molecule can have and we are counting how many molecules do we have within a given range of um, velocities. Um, and this enables a continuum treatment having still some kind of molecular information in the form of uh, statistics. Okay, um, how does a typical distribution function look like? Um, here at the top you see a few curves. Um, I will get back to the um, equilibrium distribution later on. Typically what you find is if you increase temperature, then uh, the velocity goes up. I mean, temperature is a measure of kinetic, um, of average kinetic energy. And uh, you will see that the distribution will shift to higher velocities. And um, you can then come up with all kinds of uh, analyses to look at what this distribution means. First of all, it has to be normalized in a way that if you integrate, then um, you typically get the total mass of the volume of interest. If you um, just integrate over the velocity space, not space, this is the second bullet point here, you get the density of um, your volume. So basically the fluid density as a macroscopic um, concept. If you take the first moment, then you get the momentum density in that volume. And of course you throw away a lot of information in the moment you take the, um, uh, the moment. But uh, interestingly, and this is important here already, that these moments are the things that you would later use in Navier-Stokes. So for example, the Navier-Stokes equation is concerned with density, if it's compressible, otherwise it's constant. So let's say density, pressure, velocity, and these can be obtained in um, appropriate ways from the distribution function f via integration. You throw away a lot of information, but the microscopic information is included in your f distribution. So um, now the question is, I've talked about this probability distribution function. Um, if you have this kind of um, object F, then as a physicist, you would immediately ask, how does it evolve? Because you, you cannot just have a dynamic quantity and you don't ask how, how its dynamics looks like and how does it change? So what we can do is we can take the total time derivative to see how it changes. And um, I, I do not want to, uh, want to, to talk you through this, but uh, since we have three variables now, velocity, space, space, and time, we have, of course, three terms here. And if all the molecules were just moving on straight lines, um, the answer would be zero. So if you evaluate it, you would get a zero, which means if the time derivative is not zero, then this must be due to collisions between molecules. And this is why we defer, uh, define whatever comes out of this evaluation must be something that is related to collisions and we call it the collision operator omega. So if you have molecules that are not interacting whatsoever, like let's imagine you have a bunch of neutrinos moving around, dFdt would be zero. Um, but for everything that collides, it wouldn't be zero and whatever is not zero is called the collision operator. And this is the Boltzmann equation. Well, um, it depends a bit on how omega looks like, but uh, the idea is you have the total time derivative of F, you have a collision operator, and let's call this the Boltzmann transport equation. Now, what you can show via Chapman-Enskog, Chapman-Enskog analysis, that this recovers in some asymptotic limit um, Navier-Stokes behavior, and the viscosity emerges in the process as a property of the collision operator. So some effective properties of the collision operator um, will be visible on the macro scale as a viscosity. Um, viscosity itself doesn't exist on the micro scale, right? You only have collisions between molecules on the micro scale, but on the macro scale, these collisions will be visible through the viscosity. Um, it is important to note that the Boltzmann equation has more physics than the Navier-Stokes equation simply because we have more information included. And um, Still, the Boltzmann equation doesn't give you all the molecular 
uh, information. And that's why it justified to call it a mesoscale or mesoscopic approach. And meso, of course, comes uh, from Greek and it means middle. Now, the collision operator is very difficult to handle. Uh, what I did here, I, I don't want you to, uh, to look at that in detail. I just um, grabbed it from Wikipedia. Um, the collision operator can be written as a double integral. It's basically if you assume that you just have binary collisions between always two molecules colliding, never three. Of course, in reality, it's possible that you have three particles colliding at the same time. But if you have just two, then um, you have the uh, momenta of both particles before the collision, after the collision, there will be some kind of cross section for the collision. And if you write that down properly, you can evaluate how the collision looks like in the Boltzmann equation. Now, I don't want to do that. And actually no one using lattice Boltzmann wants to do that because it's, it's extremely cumbersome, extremely challenging. There are of course methods to deal with that numerically. If you want to solve the Boltzmann equation numerically, you will have to deal with that. However, um, and this is now extremely important because many people don't know that when they hear about lattice Boltzmann, the lattice Boltzmann method, although it's called lattice Boltzmann method, has never been designed to solve the Boltzmann equation. It is an approach that has been designed to solve the Navier-Stokes equation. And as such, we can further simplify the lattice Boltzmann method in a way that it does its job as Navier-Stokes solver but you will not be able to go back easily and use it as a Navier, uh, sorry, as a Boltzmann solver. And uh, once, once we understand that, and once we accept that the lattice Boltzmann method is not a Boltzmann solver, we are actually free to do some really, really uh, provocative simplifications. And the key simplification here is that we say, okay, the collision operator is really difficult to, to deal with, Let's be extremely abrupt here and replace it by a relaxation model where we say, okay, if we have any distribution function f and we let it evolve, it will just relax to the equilibrium distribution function after some time. And this is exactly what you see in the equation at the bottom. The collision operator basically assumes here, this is the um, famous BGK operator, which was introduced in 1954. Um, the assumption is you start with f at a given time and over a time called tau, you relax to the equilibrium distribution function f equilibrium. And that is everything that we need in order to recover Navier-Stokes behavior. Um, it's an oversimplification for many applications, but not if you're interested in solving the Navier-Stokes equation, because this is actually, as far as I know, the simplest collision model you can use that will still give you Navier-Stokes behavior. The viscosity that you have in Navier-Stokes is a function of the relaxation time tau. Um, I will not show that later. I will just show you how, how the relationship looks like, but I will not derive it. And this is the so-called single relaxation time uh, approach because this is the simplest you can write down. It's a single relaxation time. Um, well, here, this is just to show that any velocity, molecular velocity, can be written as the center of mass velocity of the volume of interest. And um, uh, the, yeah, the, the, the velocity of the center of mass and the center of mass velocity of the molecules. Now, equilibrium distribution, I don't want to spend too much time here. You can write down the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, which is used for the equilibrium distribution function. And based on physical considerations, it can only depend on conserved quantities, which are density, momentum, and energy. And um, this is something that is uh, well known and available in basically every textbook about uh, statistical physics. So I, I do not want to talk more about that. So to wrap up my um, overview of the kinetic theory, important is that we have some level of scale separation, which makes it relatively easy to perform some coarse graining we introduced to the distribution function on the mesoscale. The Boltzmann equation is the governing equation for the distribution function. The collision operator tells us how uh, we can capture the collision of molecules. And this is where all the interesting physics happens because without collisions, we would just have particles moving on straight lines unless we have external forces. Um, the key idea here is we can introduce the BGK operator for certain problems. We, this is justified. 
for example, for fluid mechanics, where we just assume relaxation towards an equilibrium. And uh, we get the macroscopic moments that we have in um, the macroscopic variables so that we have in navier stokes uh, as moments of the equilibrium, sorry, of the distribution function f. So let's talk a bit about Lattice Boltzmann, and I see time is running. Uh, the key idea is to use, to start with the Boltzmann equation or the Lattice Boltzmann equation to solve Navier Stokes rather than discretizing Navier Stokes directly. This is the key idea. And this is not just a random idea. There is mathematical proof that this can be done thanks to the chapman enskog analysis. And I will touch upon it uh, later quickly. Um, so what we need to do is we need to simulate the evolution of F rather than of the velocity and pressure directly. And you could say, uh, you know, the Boltzmann equation is more complex than the Navier-Stokes equation. It doesn't make any sense to have something where we have more degrees of freedom, we have velocity space. It's, you know, why do you want to make it more complicated? The thing is, um, it actually works pretty well. And um, what we need to do in order to get there, we have to discretize uh, F we need to ask, how does the lattice Boltzmann equation look like? How are the lattice Boltzmann equation and the Navier-Stokes equation linked? Because we want to know whether we actually solve the Navier-Stokes equation. And of course, we need to show that it works in practice. So I want to give you a very panoramic overview. How do we discretize F? First of all, we need to discretize space. And typically, we create a lattice. As you can see here, we chop time into equidistant intervals in the simplest form. And velocity space, yeah, this is where it's getting interesting. Um, the sphere illustrates an isotropic physical space. But if we work on a lattice, then of course we have main axis. And the question is now, do we still have isotropy in velocity space if we somehow map our velocity discretization to the spatial discretization? Now, the short answer is yes and no. No, because we break isotropy to some degree because we have to introduce a finite number of velocity vectors, but we can do that in a way that isotropy is retained up to the order of interest. And that, that is probably um, most of what, uh, what I want to talk, talk about in terms of how to choose the lattice for the velocity. Um, now what happens is, let's remember, we want to solve Navier-Stokes. We don't want to solve the Boltzmann equation which means in the end, we are just interested in the evolution of density or pressure and velocity. We are not really that interested in the evolution of F, which means what is really interesting and important are the integrals of F, the moments of F. Now, what we can do, uh, we can be very smart by using the um, Hermit expansion to um, replace these integrals by finite sums to make it tractable computationally. And I will get back to that. Typical lattices for the velocity that we use, um, I mean, you have an infinite number of possible velocity directions in the real world, but we can get away with only nine velocities, for example, in 2D and between, let's say 15 and 19 or 27 velocities in 3D, um, you can expand your velocity space further, but I do not want to talk about that. For conventional Navier-Stokes, you just need nine discrete vectors for the velocity space in 2D and typically 19 in 3D. I will not bore you with all the details how we can show that. And um, what we can do is now we can use the gauss amit quadrature rule, which I will very uh, briefly sketch on the next slide, to recover the moments, which are the interesting variables, by summing up the populations which are now discretized uh, in velocity space. So why, why do we use the gauss amit quadrature rule? Um, as you might know, quadrature rules are rules that allow us to evaluate integrals over functions by finite sums. And if we are very smart about about doing that, we can get away with a very, very small number of terms in the sum. Um, in a nutshell, for Lattice Boltzmann, um, we need uh, typically only three terms in the equation along each axis, which means in one dimension, we would only need three terms in the sum on the right-hand side, 
to accurately integrate the moments so that we are interested in. In 2D, you can imagine you have three by three, so that gives you the nine velocity vectors. In 3D, it would be three times three times three, 27, but you can show if you take advantage of some symmetries, you can reduce it uh, a bit to 19 or 15. Um, so the gauss emmy quadrature rule makes it actually possible to get away with a very, very small number of discrete velocities compared to infinity, right? Now, um, we start with a Boltzmann equation. We can discretize it now by writing a finite difference for the populations on the left-hand side, um, where we take a certain number of uh, lattice Boltzmann equations, one for each discrete velocity. So in 2D, we would have nine of these equations. And we have the collision operator, which we typically approximate by using the BGK um, operator. Now, um, how does it work? We start, uh, how does the algorithm work? We start at a given grid point. We have in 2D, we have our nine so-called populations Fi that point in different directions. And this is indicated by red in the equation. Now the collision step means that we relax towards equilibrium. And you can now see that we are still at the same point that our populations redistribute themselves in order to move closer to the equilibrium. And then we propagate or stream our populations to the next neighbor according to the direction where they point in. And if you now imagine you do that at every grid point, then you will also, after the time step, you will have nine populations again at each grid point. So everything is moving over the lattice during the streaming step, but streaming and collision are decoupled in lattice Boltzmann. So the advantages are um, collisions are local, as you have seen, and algebraic. It's You just need to work out the equilibrium distribution function and you're done. And propagation is linear and exact because you basically go along characteristics and you can show that this is uh, exact. Um, you might ask now, what about viscosity? The viscosity is directly related to the single relaxation time that we used in the BGK operator tau. We also have a speed of sound here that I do not want to talk about in detail, uh, which emerges from the um, lattice Boltzmann algorithm. And we can write down the discretized version of the Maxwell Boltzmann equilibrium that we use in the lattice Boltzmann algorithm. And there's all a very, very strict mathematical um, basis for this. I'm just not, I'm not making this up. You can read about that, for example, in the textbook. Uh, you can show this all mathematically strictly. Um, so maybe I want to skip that because it's just walking you through the algorithm again. And um, the question is, why does it work? Well, first of all, if we choose a lattice that is sufficiently symmetric and isotropic, then the discretization is very forgiving. And you, you have momentum conservation, you have mass conservation, you have a sufficient amount of isotropy that is already very good for recovering navier stokes and um, to do this mathematically, you can use the chapman enskog analysis, which really shows you how you can recover Navier-Stokes from the lattice Boltzmann equation. I don't want to do this uh, in detail. It would take too much time. Um, some people say that uh, people who work in lattice Boltzmann, you know, you know uh, how it is. You, you should, once in your life, you should um, um, uh, climb a mountain, you should plant a tree, and you should perform the chapman enskog analysis, basically, when you work in Lattice Boltzmann. Um, there's a, a rigorous mathematical approach. You can also use other expansion methods where you can um, massage the Lattice Boltzmann equation and show using a multi-scale expansion that you actually recover to leading order or leading orders the Navier-Stokes equation. And the good thing is also that you get an expression for the error terms, which means you can immediately see where the algorithm might not work properly. You also get the equation of state, uh, the expression for the viscosity, and so on. Now, in terms of advantages of lattice Boltzmann, um, it is um, typically very fast because it's uh, you don't um, have to solve any implicit um, uh, equation systems. There's no Poisson equation involved here. Um, the price you have to pay is you have pressure waves moving around, which means this is only working well in the low Mach number regime, which is actually one of the assumptions of the lattice Boltzmann method. It only works well in the small Knudsen number regime. It's um, because you have thrown away a lot of the Boltzmann equation, of the content of the Boltzmann equation. You cannot simply go back with lattice Boltzmann to the large Knudsen number 
in the original form. You have to add more functionality in again if you want to use Lattice Boltzmann uh, for large Knudsen number flows. That's important to remember. And Lattice Boltzmann is always transient, which means if you're interested in um, a stationary problem, then Lattice Boltzmann might not be the best solver for that because sometimes it takes a lot of time to converge to the um, solution you want to have. Uh, but there are accelerated Lattice Boltzmann schemes which are particularly for stationary problems. Um, Lattice Boltzmann can be parallelized quite easily because it's more or less local and um, it is possible to apply it to uh, complex geometries. Now, some main areas of development, um, just to show you that this is not a completed method. I mean, people are still using it and uh, I mean, they're developing it and working on the method rather than applying it. If you look at the equation here, delta F would be the streaming step, omega is the collision operator, and S is a source term that I haven't talked about yet. And um, you can improve the Lattice Boltzmann algorithm by looking at all of these three things and uh, do some further research and improve the way it, it works. For example, if you improve this, uh, the streaming, uh, you can implement advanced boundary conditions that are based on the bounce back method, which I believe I don't have time to cover that later. No, um, you can get back to rarefied gases if you revise it the way um, the populations are streamed. You can, as you see on the right hand side, you can actually have a hybrid discretization of Lattice Boltzmann where you use a finite volume discretization. Um, it is not just on a lattice. Some people say you shouldn't combine finite volume with Lattice Boltzmann because then it's not a lattice algorithm anymore. Well, um, it's a philosophical question really, but you can mathematically, you can do it. Um, you can work on the collision operator. For example, you can replace it by other collision operators to recover the advection diffusion equation or other transport equations, even relativistic fluid mechanics. Uh, you can um, introduce other relaxation times. You can look at compressible flows. Uh, you can improve the stability of the algorithm by um, massaging the collision operator for high Reynolds number flows, turbulence. If you look at the, um, uh, something went wrong here in my um, list. If you look at the source term, uh, you can include reactions, multi-phase flows via uh, surface tension, for example, and also fluid structure interaction using, for example, the immersed boundary method, which um, works via forces acting on the flow rather than as a proper boundary condition. There are a number of open source codes available. I do not want you to um, look at all of them now, but um, I guess you will have access to the slides later. If you are interested in um, working with Lattice Boltzmann, this might be a good starting point. Um, now, what I want to do maybe at the end, um, because time is short, let me see if I can quickly Yeah, move out here. Just give me a second. So you should now see um, a browser window. Now this is um, an, a Lattice Boltzmann implementation that uh, a summer student implemented uh, two years ago. And here the idea is that uh, we can have, for example, um, uh, this is a fluid box. Currently, there's no flow, but there's diffusion going on. You can see that uh, the color blobs are diffusing. What we have here is we have one Lattice Boltzmann equation for fluid flow and three Lattice Boltzmann equations for advection diffusion. And we have a reaction, a very simple reaction between the green and the blue fluids. And now what I can do, I can create a bit of flow by, by moving things around. And when these two get in contact, you see they start reacting and um, you can see there is a bit of turbulence happening. This is in 2D and this is now happening in my browser. So uh, you, can, you can actually download this code. It's open source and you can work with that uh, just to demonstrate uh, what can be done with Lattice Boltzmann. I think the resolution here is 200 by 200 or something like this. And uh, there are four Lattice Boltzmann equations running um, on my laptop right now in the browser. And you can add uh, some additional chemicals here and move it around and um, play with it. Just to demonstrate to you that um, Lattice Boltzmann actually works. You might see that there's something 
there are some pressure waves moving around here, which uh, looks a bit funny. Uh, that is because we didn't have time to implement a, a proper model where we have a high bulk viscosity. It's uh, based on the single relaxation time, which means in order to have small viscosities, we would take a small shear viscosity, obviously, but this also means a shear bulk visc uh, a small bulk viscosity, which is not really appropriate for incompressible flows. And that's an artifact that you can see here. But I think as a demonstrator, a web demonstrator, it is actually very nice to, um, to see how you can actually um, use the lattice Boltzmann method as a fast neighbor stroke solver. Okay, so let me go back to my main presentation. I'm, I'm nearly done. I will skip the boundary conditions. So we are here now. Okay, so what did we learn? Um, we need to simulate the evolution of the distribution function f to solve the Navier-Stokes equation. We need to discretize velocity space in particular, and I gave you some idea how this can be done. The lattice Boltzmann equation is quite simple to implement, but of course the devil is in the details. If you want to have high accuracy methods, um, additional physics, it gets arbitrarily complicated, of course. Right, it would be wrong to say lattice Boltzmann is always simple. Um, you can show mathematically that you actually solve asymptotically, solve the Navier Stokes equation. It's a relatively fast algorithm, it can be parallelized, um, used for complex geometries, and it is in its original form not suitable for high Knudsen or high Mach number, although there are um, additions that are the modifications that can be used. I will now skip the boundary conditions and jump just to the summary. Um, so that's my last slide. What I demonstrated today, um, I gave you a very quick uh, run through of uh, kinetic theory, which we need in order to appreciate what Lattice Boltzmann is and where it comes from. Lattice Boltzmann is a fast alternative neighbor stroke solver, not a Boltzmann solver. It is useful for a number of applications, for example, uh, incompressible low Mach number flows in its original form. It can be used for high Reynolds number simulations with a bit of tweaking of the collision operator. It's, it's a very good method for direct numerical simulation of turbulence. You can use it for complex geometries. It is often used for multi-physics simulations where you have additional things going on, suspension flow, um, electromagnetic fields. Uh, Lattice Boltzmann has been used for relativistic fluid mechanics, even for the um, Maxwell equations. And it is a popular method for high performance computing. And I didn't talk about uh, the bounce back method today. Um, so you just have to believe me that the bounce back method is a simple kinetic boundary condition for Lattice Boltzmann that doesn't have any analogy in conventional CFD methods. And with this, I would like to uh, finish and thank you very much for your attention. Dr. Tim Kruger, thank you so much for the presentation. We are now open to questions. If you want to participate, please enable your microphone or write it down in the chat and we will read it. Also, our YouTube viewers can write it down too, of course. Thank you, Tim. Please. For this very nice presentation and very uh, tutorial, nice tutorial uh, materials. Uh, I'd like to, uh, you to comment something about uh, the limitation that you're talking about. It may be very related to the collision model. Can you talk about this? Um, it's not only the collision model. If you assume, okay, so there are different aspects, for example, in the moment you restrict your velocity space to just a handful of velocity vectors, um, you are already throwing away the capability of uh, simulating rarefied gases. Um, so if you want to use Lattice Boltzmann and apply to rarefied gases, you would have to take a few more velocity vectors back. Um, that's one thing. For the, um, let's say for the low Mach number approximation, it's also related to that. You cannot simply change the collision operator and then simulate um, high Mach number flows because if your flow is faster than the propagation speed of information on the lattice, so then obviously it wouldn't work. So you need larger velocity stencils, both for higher Knudsen number and higher Mach number. Um, if you want to look at compressible flow, um, typically, you would also need a bulk viscosity. 
And that can actually be introduced quite easily in Lattice Boltzmann, not in the BGK method, the single relaxation time method, but there are ways to reintroduce additional relaxation times, which would give you additional modes of dissipation, for example, for, for bulk viscosity. Um, I think these are the major assumptions that we make. Also, uh, we have an ideal gas equation or state for Lattice Boltzmann, which means we cannot normally have high uh, pressure fluctuations and high density fluctuations in Lattice Boltzmann. Um, the density plays a double role in Lattice Boltzmann because on the one hand, the density should be more or less constant to get isotro uh, sorry, um, incompressible flow. But it has to fluctuate a bit because we have an um, ideal gas equation of state. Uh, and this is, of course, somehow conflicting. You cannot, you cannot have everything at once. And this is where some disadvantages come in. You can navigate around that by knowing very well how you set up your simulations. But the truth is that there are some situations you simply cannot simulate with Lattice Boltzmann. Uh, but I think that applies to every um, computational method. Thanks. Now, please, Hamon. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kruger, for your talk. I'm very, very happy having you here today. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is about education. Uh, I don't know about other countries, but here in Brazil, it's not so common that undergraduate students learn CFD modeling during the engineering courses. Uh, I mean, uh, fixed and available hands-on course to numerically solve the, the fluid dynamic equations. Uh, but when there is such a course, the, the most professors use open form to teach CFD modeling. So, so I ask, what's your opinion about inserting LDM as a numerical technique for CFD modeling in these courses? And do you understand LDM as a potential open form competitor, or maybe just as one more technique that can help to understand physics? Right. Um, yeah, to take your first question about education, um, also in the UK, it's not extremely common to teach CFD or related methods in undergraduate courses. Uh, we have a course CFD, but it's an optional course, and uh, I don't know exactly how many students take that course, but um, I would say that most students who graduate as a, with an undergraduate degree in, in the UK, they would not have a very strong background in CFD. That's, I think, that probably similar in, in many countries, but there are some other countries where uh, students learn, learn more, for example, also during their final year project or something like this. Um, now, I think that, uh, I know that there are some colleagues of mine who teach lattice sportsmen at the university and I think they teach it also as undergraduate courses. It is definitely possible. And uh, that would be mostly um, an optional course uh, for people who are interested in that, but it's definitely possible and uh, people do that. Um, well, to use it as a competitor for open foam, open foam is basically a library of different uh, solvers and different methods. I would be very careful with any statements when I, I cannot really, you know, that is Boltzmann is an alternative method. Um, maybe it's a competitive method if, you know, sometimes you have a problem where you can use different solvers for the same problem. And then I would say it's a competitor, right? Uh, but sometimes you just have approaches that are particularly suitable for one problem and other methods are suitable for another problem. So I would really um, see Lattice Boltzmann as one tool in a toolbox and finite volume um, is another tool in the toolbox. And um, I think it is important to keep in mind that if you are interested as a scientist in a different problem, you might have to switch from Lattice Boltzmann to finite volume or the other way around. So I, I, I would be really careful making strong statements. Um, but of course, there are um, open source codes available in Lattice Boltzmann that can be used for a uh, variety of problems, and they are used for that. For example, Palabos and OpenFB and Vibella. Um, I would say they are probably not as mature as uh, OpenFoam because OpenFoam has been around for some time. And um, so I cannot give you a very definite answer, but 
Um, I think we just need to keep in mind that there are different tools available for different problems, but we should always go back to, to this one slide that I showed, what is actually the best, or maybe not the best, but an appropriate method for the problem of interest. Okay, thank you. Okay, now Professor Ahajimiru, please. Okay, John. <laughs> Thanks for, uh, and uh, Professor Kruger, uh, thanks for this clear uh, motivating presentation about Max Boson, mainly for the new student that, that's here. Uh, my, I have two questions about that. One is uh, just, uh, I want to see some comments uh, from you uh, regarding to the combination of uh, population balance model with Max Boson. Persuasion. And another one, uh, how uh, you, you mentioned about combining finding volume with Lutz Boltzmann equation. And yep. uh, I want, uh, how are you applying that? Uh, you are doing that quadrature approximation inside of finite volume or something different? Uh, make some comment about that approach. Okay. Um, so let, let me take your uh, last question first for the finite volume discretization. It's, Basically, the, the main thing you change is the, um, uh, the streaming step. You still have the, the same volume, uh, okay. velocity discretization, where you have, let's say, D2Q9 for the two dimensional or D3Q9. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, for the um, uh, velocity space discretization, it's mostly the streaming step that you change because in the Conventional lattice Boltzmann method, you assume that a population starting at a grid point will, after exactly one time step, end up at another grid point. And this is something that you don't claim anymore when you use um, unstructured grids, for example. I have not used it myself, so I'm, I'm not the best person to answer that question. But uh, what you can do is, if you go back to my presentation, there is a, um, a DOI under the a finite volume figure, and that points you to a paper where this is explained. Uh, you also had another question about a population yes, balance. Exactly. So, um, I mean, um, you can probably do this exactly as you would do it with a conventional neighbor Stokes server, because Lattice Boltzmann can be considered, in at least in, in this presentation here, as a neighbor Stokes server. So, if you um, typically combine population balance models with, let's say, finite differences uh, for navier strokes you could probably also do it with Lattice Boltzmann. Um, of course, it depends really on the problem you have, whether Lattice Boltzmann would give you an advantage. I, I cannot answer the question without knowing more about what you're interested in. Okay, I was more worried about the, how you deal with the, the velocity field with the different uh, kind of uh, particle size and the different velocity they may have. Look in the physics, not on the Navier-Stokes equation that doesn't deal with that uh, different velocity. So if you, um, if you treat any Navier-Stokes server as a black box, right, then you can in principle replace whatever is happening inside your black box. Yeah. which means you can replace a finite difference or finite volume solver by a lattice Boltzmann solver. Mm. And let's say you have done the testing and verification, validation, and so on. Uh, you could just believe the output of the velocity field and then couple it to your population balances uh, any way you want. And uh, then of course you might have to couple it back. For example, if you have um, particles moving, then maybe the viscosity changes locally. That is something that can be done with lattice Boltzmann. So you can, um, you can have a bidirectional coupling using, for example, the source term or the collision term in Lattice Boltzmann, where you modify fluid properties locally. That is that is definitely possible. All right. Thank you very much. Now, Professor Haja, please. <laughs> Professor, sorry, I think your microphone is off. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you, Professor, for your um, excellent introduction to Lattice Boltzmann and simplifications. Some clarifications. One is your use of Hermite poly polynomials. There's a limit to the order of a polynomial. Say, what kind of use of 
Um, there's a good reason why you use uh, um, Hermit polynomials, and that is because um, your equilibrium distribution function is an, a function that looks like e to the power of minus x square. Right. And and you integrate from minus to plus infinity, and that is calling for the um, Hermit uh, Gauss Hermit uh, quadrature. So if you use some other polynomials, uh, uh, the degree of the polynomial does it make uh, any difference? For example, I mean, you could probably use other polynomials, but I wouldn't see what the benefit is because the um, Hermit polynomials are already doing exactly what we need. Uh, a simple exponential instead of e minus x squared, for example. Uh, sorry, can you say again? Uh, simple exponential decrease instead um, of maximum. I mean, it's mathematically, it's maybe possible to do this, but uh, probably no one would do it because the Hamid polynomials are giving us exactly what we need. The other comment is for general things. The classical criticism of Boltzmann equations about reversibility. Do you have any question of that? Is introducing reversibility in an artificial manner with a pollution operator? Yes. Um, that, that's a very good question. Um, in the moment you introduce a relaxation process, the BTK operator, you of course introduce a time direction because you, you relax towards an equilibrium, right? Now, um, the thing is, we use Lattice Boltzmann as a Navier-Stokes server, not as a Boltzmann server. And viscosity in Navier-Stokes is doing the same thing because um, you have irreversible flows. Viscous flows are irreversible flows. And um, using the BGK operator gives us exactly what we need in terms of Navier strokes. And so once you make the decision that you are interested in Navier strokes, then the uh, BGK approximation is a good approximation. If you okay. want to solve the Boltzmann equation, that's a completely different discussion. Okay. Uh, for the last uh, clarification, how easy to get open source simulators for this you commented extensively on open form and you also show several other available simulators and uh, algorithms available for public use how easy to use them is it easy to get them for example um, so it is it is definitely easy to get them uh, um, it is, it is easy to get them. I have this one slide um, uh, with many uh, paper references. I just picked six of them, but um, it is very easy to download these codes and some of them are really well documented and uh, there are tutorials available and so on. Now, the question is what you want to do with them. If you just want to run a few test simulations, I would say it is easy with most of them. If you want to change the geometries, it might be straightforward, but if you want to change the functionality, that could be a real pain because um, for some codes, you need to be a software engineer to add new features. And um, I am not using any of these open source codes personally for, for myself. For my own research, we have our in-house code. Uh, one of my postdocs is currently in this call and he is also using one of the open source codes. Um, but uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, I use um, our in-house code, which is uh, quite simple to modify when, when I need to. And I think uh, just to, just to, to um, contribute to that answer, um, I believe that um, a big problem in the community is that not always um, do you have well-documented, easy to modify open source codes that can be used by, for example, if you have a new PhD student, you don't want the PhD student to develop the same method again that has already been published, right? But sometimes it might take a, a lot of time for somebody to get up to speed with a method. And I think this is something where the Lattice Boltzmann com community can still improve a bit. Maybe you will change your students, send them to you to train, and then how to use your code. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor Hajin.
So do we have any more questions? Okay, so I think our time is almost over and I want to thank you everyone for the discussion. And once again, thank you, Dr. Tim Kruger for the presentation. Thank you very much for the invitation. It was a lot of fun. It was a pleasure of ours. So our seminars are being recorded and posted on YouTube. Of course, after the invite lectures agreement, please check them out on our YouTube channel. And this is our organization committee. We are responsible for inviting and communicating with the lecturers. We also handle social media, video editing, certificate writings, and hosting. Thank you all for being here today. And we will meet again in the next week, October 6th, at the seminar that will be given by Professor Andres Mejia. The title will be announced soon. Thank you and see you there.